So, hi, uh, thanks for coming. My name's John Evans. Um, I'm going to be going through uh, a couple of things today, focusing on service assurance and focusing on how we can apply analytics to service assurance. I'm going to be taking quite a different approach than probably you've seen before. Okay, so feel free to ask questions. Um, I've got a couple of, uh, couple of people here to help me. So afterwards, um, I'll try and get through it fast enough that we can do a demo with Paola, who's going to show this in action. Um, and then Michelle, who's here as well, is from uh, uh, a company called Moogsoft, who, who uh, um, have a, an analytics uh, um, uh, service assurance product, which is part of what I show as we go through the slides, okay? So um, they're, here to, they're here to help, and um, uh, let's get going. So... Context couple of points that I want to really lay out at the start. First one is, if I, I, I'm not going to do it because of time, but I suspect if I ask each of you what service assurance is, I'm going to get a slightly different answer to the problem. Second is, if you look at how we implement broadly service assurance systems today, we, we can have quite a large dependency on things like static rules, uh, in, you know, if you're using Netcool or something like that, or static thresholds in performance management systems. And those systems based upon static rules, static thresholds, or static models can be challenged in today's complex network environments. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on, firstly, I'm going to redefine service assurance because, you know, I can't, we can't measure whether or not what I'm talking about gives you a positive outcome unless we've got a clear definition. So I'll try and do that clear definition. And then I'll talk through how we could apply analytics to solve the problem. Um, uh, and then lastly, um, show how we can realize that. Okay. Um, so firstly, let's, let's talk about the redefinition. And, and I, I know as soon as I put the slide up, you're going to read it. But let me, let me give you the simple version before we get to the kind of uh, uh, the qualified version. Simple version for me of what service assurance is trying to achieve is to, number one, tell me whether or not my service is working, as it should. Number two, uh, if it's not working, tell me what the underlying cause is. And number three, equip somebody to go and fix that problem. Okay? That's my paraphrase of what service assurance is. But, but that's a kind of subjective description, and we need to objectify that so that we can measure it and measure whether or not we're achieving those goals. So I'm, going to define it, uh, uh, so I'm going to define it a little more specifically. I'm going to define it as all of those functions we use to make sure that we deliver the quality of experience required. And I'm not going to define what that is. Uh, you know, it, it, it depends upon the service. It may be just network connectivity. It may be connectivity with a certain SLA. It may be to make sure that particular applications work. But you know, in different environments, that measure will be different. And it's to make sure that we're delivering that quality of experience that as we've defined it, day zero, as we actually enable the service, which is what I mean by day one, and day two is on an ongoing basis. Okay? And I'm going to specify two goals. One is that I'm gonna, I want to maximize that quality of experience to, to, to the end user. But I could do that by having you know, a thousand people in the knock where each person's looking at one element of the end-to-end -end delivery, that's not going to be a cost-effective solution. So, so I'm going to balance that with trying to minimize the cost, okay? Because if I just do this, I end up with the most expensive possible solution, which is not, not what we want, okay? So on those two goals, maximize quality experience, minimize cost, let's do a little bit of a drill down, say, how do, how do we achieve that? So if I want to maximize quality of experience, First thing I've got to do is mon monitor it. If I'm trying to deliver a service to somebody, if I'm trying to deliver a service to you such that, you know, when your, your home broadband service is delivering good video, video quality, if I'm not in some way monitoring what I'm delivering, uh, um, you know, how do, I, how do I know whether or not I'm delivering uh, the service as I should? So we need some monitoring function that's going to monitor at the service level, okay? Not just monitor the devices, but really monitor at the service level. Then uh, if I do that, I can now say, OK, if I'm monitoring it, if I fall below thresholds, I know that I'm going to determine that service is unavailable. And then I can gear my service assurance functions as trying to maximize that service availability. Okay? 
So, and, you know, a follow on to that is having done that, I want to be able to display in real time my service is working or my service is not. And if it's not working, you know, I want to inform you proactively, not, not, not reactively. So, that's about maximizing quality of experience, but let's, let's go to minimizing cost of operations, this balancing point. So how do I minimize the cost I'm putting into my service assurance solutions? So firstly, repeated point, we're gonna we need to maximize service availability. Why? Because if my service is not available, I need to have somebody trying to fix it. You know, kind of statement of the obvious. If my service is completely unavailable, I've got people permanently working trying to fix the problem. So let's define it. You know, uh, let's define that specifically. So the availability of my service is the time that it's working over the total time. You know, it's unavailable for a day in a year or whatever it may be. But let's decompose that. Okay. And I'm going to decompose it into, into three functions. MTBF, the mean time between failures, um, which is repeated here. MTTD, the mean time to detect the failure, because I've got obviously you know, a time after the failures happened uh, 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 to detect it. And then lastly, mean time, uh, MTTR, mean time to repair. So if I want to maximize service availability, I effectively want to maximize the top of the equation, minimize the bottom of the equation. Maximize the top. I want to maximize my mean time between failures. To do that, I've got to learn from previous failures and try and ensure they don't happen again. And I've got to identify issues and try and resolve them before they're service impacting. Okay? This is about maximizing the top. But then I want to minimize these two. The time to detect the problem, detect it proactively before somebody else does, and the time to repair the problem, that consists of two things. You know, one is, I know I've got a problem, but what's the cause? So trying to pin down the cause. And secondly, having pinned down the cause, giving somebody the information so they can go and fix it, which is you know, a crucially important part of the process. Okay, so we've done our definitions. Let's now look at how, you know, how we would realize that. So I'm going to go now to functions, and then we'll talk about how we realize those functions in analytics. So let me break down a set of functions. The first one, I'm going to call service health. This is, is my service working or not? A, 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 a green, amber, red of whether my service is working or not. Okay. Secondly, fault management. Fault management is my, OK, my service is not working. What is the underlying cause? Cause isolation, identify the cause. Secondly, service impact analysis. Okay, I know I've got a problem and I know I've got a cause. Is it impacting customer service? Okay, if it's not, this probably isn't a priority issue in the list. If it is, I want to stick it up the priority stone. Okay, so that was fault management. Next, performance management. So performance management is, a, is, is around metrics not around events. This is really around event management. This is around metrics. Is my service, uh, uh, are the underlying elements of my service performing as they should? Or is the utilization of my, are the utilization of my links too high? Am I getting, uh, 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 am I getting high errors? Whatever, whatever it may be, this is around ma managing those, those underlying metrics. And then lastly, incident and problem management. So incident and problem management is, okay, I understand I've got a problem. I understand the priority of that problem. How do I equip somebody to go and fix the problem? So I need to map the problem firstly to, a, let's say, a trouble ticket in a system so that somebody can do something with it. I want to prioritize that trouble ticket so that somebody that's picking it off a queue is going to, you know, it's going to be at the top of the queue or the bottom of the queue. I want to enrich it with as much information as possible so somebody knows what it is they're going to fix and why. Uh, and then lastly, you know, having in tracking the resolution of that problem, I want to capture everything that goes on so that next time we have this problem, hopefully we don't, but the next time that we do, somebody knows much faster what they need to do, do to go and fix it. Okay. Now, before we get into the you know, the blocks where we talk about the functions and how we actually do this. Um, a, a, a couple of slides on, if you like, lessons learned, which relate to how we, I guess, how we've done things for quite a long period of time. 
First one is, if you're really trying to assure an end-to-end -end service, don't do it by trying to assure each silo that, 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 that it, if you like, domain responsible for the service. So if you assure your data center domain, and then you assure your wide area domain, and then you assure your branch domain, and you do them all separately, and you have a problem, you're going to struggle trying to work out where, where, where is that problem? Have I got three separate teams working on this? How do I bring that together? So you know, for most effective service assurance, do it across the end-to-end -end service, not focused on each domain. Secondly, we, we've, we talked about managing, uh, monitoring the quality of experience of the service. So you can kind of consider that as the, you know, a key indicator of is my service working or not. But I need to bring that top level inf uh, indication of the service health together with the bottom up information of event data and metric data I'm getting from the underlying devices. And by bringing that together, I'm able to bring together an understanding of is my service working or not with what are those things that are causal to that. Okay. Okay, so secondly, um, we, we've mentioned event data and metric data. We need to use both, okay? Um, in some environments we see, if, if, if you look at uh, uh, you know, some sort of web app type environments, it's quite common to, uh, um, I think the, 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 the phrase is uh, um, measure the world, is to try and use performance management as a means for trying to understand exactly what's going on. Performance management is an input, it's a useful input, it's not the only input, in the same way Event management is not the only input. So we need to bring both event data and uh, metric data or time series data together. We want to try and minimize any static rules and thresholds because they're inflexible, hard, you know, bit, uh, 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 and as we scale, what, what thresholds should I use for a particular metric in a particular place? How do I define that? How do I update that? Uh, what rule should I use? How do I define that? How do I update that where, uh, as my underlying infrastructure changes? Lastly, we're going to try and map any issues we discussed to the underlying, uh, um, uh, to the underlying customer, uh, uh, customer impact using our understanding of the deployed services through service inventory. Okay, let's, let's put some building blocks uh, onto those pictures. And the build doesn't, whoops. For some reason, I'm, I'm, missing a, I'm missing a graphic. I don't know why. Um, OK, so let me then talk about how, how, do we, how do we then achieve that. And I'm going to focus on one pipeline, okay, one pipeline to process data to try and give us some of that output we're talking about. And I'm going to start with event data. Okay. So event data is telling me about states of things. It's telling me something's up, it's telling me something's down, it's telling me something's changed state, or it's telling me something's in a state. And, and event data is, what is it? It's logs, it's SNMP traps, uh, um, it's, it's, it's those, that kind of data. Now, I collect that data and I collect it from my underlying network, uh, uh, my underlying network and, uh, 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 and infrastructure, compute storage. But I also take the event data from my service monitoring. I bring all those together. And the first thing I need to do is I need to filter out noise. So, you know, if, if every minute my router's sending a log, you know, just to say I'm here, that's, that's not necessarily useful. Um, so that periodic information is, re is not necessarily key. So here we can apply filters to filter out noise. In the same way with digital radio, you can apply a filter to filter out noise. You can apply filters to filter out noise in event data. Okay? So the idea of this is take away the stuff that is, you know, that is regular recurring noise and try and leave you stuff that's relevant. And noise filtering in analytics is a very common, you know, is a common process to get rid of data that's not relevant. So I've got, you know, I've gone from a million events to a thousand events, let's say. My thousand events, what do I, well, what, is it, what does it mean? So second stage is clustering. Group together those events that are indicative or, or that, are, that are associated with an underlying problem, okay? So a link fails. OK, 
Okay, I've got an event from the routers at either end. I may get an event from my optical layer. I may get an event from an application that's complaining that, 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 that it's lost connectivity. I may get you know, multiple layers of events in, uh, uh, I'll, I'll get an event from my quality of experience uh, uh, monitoring. So, you know, I've got this whole set of events, but I really want to be able to group those together to be able to identify that set of stuff there, that's associate, they're all associated with each other. And there are various analytical methods that can be used in order to do that clustering, okay? Again, you know, another set of algorithms here that are kind of oriented around how you, uh, uh, how you cluster data, okay? So now let's, let's imagine I've gone from a million events, I've applied some filtering get down to a thousand events, okay? I've got a thousand events here. I cluster those, and they can be clustered in time context, they can be clustered using natural language processing. There are multiple, multiple contexts you can use to cluster those. I cluster those and I discover, well actually what I've got is three groups of events, not, uh, 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 not just a thousand or events. Now, when you've got determined that you've then got those clusters, I can now apply a third order of analytics within the cluster to say, well, wh which of these discrete events is causal? And so how can you do that? Well, you can do that through, again, mul multiple means. One is just purely time context. In that group, what happened first? If I know they're associated, what was the first thing that complained? Okay. Now, that's not necessarily causal, but those things kind of give you indications. And if you combine those with an understanding of, uh, uh, with an understanding of dependency, um, then you can start to you know, really identify, okay, within million events, reduced to a thousand, grouped into three groups, this thing was causal. So that's the kind of basic, that's the basic flow uh, in this event processing pipeline. So I've not spoken about metrics yet, I've just spoken about events. So the result of that was what? Was, was three clusters of events with some, something inside that says, oh, this thing's, this thing's causal. But at this point, you know, what does it mean? It may mean nothing to me. I, I, I may not know what customers are impacted. I may not know what services are impacted. So I need to enrich that, that, that information with an understanding of the customer. And I've, if I've got an orchestrated service, you know, if I've got a system that's deployed those services, I can take the service inventory out of that, and the service inventory is something I can input into that process in order to give me context of the output. So rather than just being, you know, some uh, a, a group of events, it's actually an incident that represents an impact to customers X, Y, and Z. Okay, so I'm going to go on to my net to the next pipeline. Okay, which is oops. Let's go back, which is um, around service status. And this was really bringing in that, so bringing in that inventory. So I've called it a real-time inventory. Uh, Paolo's gonna show a case where we use the Yang models from orchestration and we bring the Yang models into, uh, 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 into be able to enrich the information we've got coming out of the service assurance system to do our service impact analysis and be able to present a, a, a view, of our, view of our service status. Um, whoops. Okay, and then I'm going to talk about why I, I talk about a last element, uh, which is around what we do with that time series data. So when I say time series data, I mean metrics. I mean you know numbers that are representing the current characteristic of a particular metric somewhere um, fr from the underlying network or infrastructure. So let's ta let's consider a simple you know really simple one: link utilization. I could set a threshold to say when my link utilization exceeds 99%, you know, for three consecutive samples, it's an issue. Pretty, you know, arbitrary number. Uh, how do I come up with a number? Well, it's arbitrary. Um, but nonetheless, that you could you could set that as your anomaly threshold. From that, you generate an alert. Your alert goes into that previous pipeline I just said, you know, and then that's a way of doing it. But the trouble is, how do you set that 99%? And how do you know it's indicative of a problem? Well, it's quite, it's quite difficult to do, actually. And, and uh, it might be 99% on that. It might be 92% on something else. It might be another percent on something else. So there's another set of analytics, which is looking at metric data to determine things that are anomalous. And anomalous means you know, uh, not normal. 
So it kind of implies that you observe what's going on, you take a baseline, and then you pull out, okay, well, what I've got at the moment is, is, is you know, not normal. It's, 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 it's not in line with the baseline that I've understood. So, so let's say that we've got, and I'm going to touch on the pipeline for anomaly detection. Let's say we've got an algorithm that's doing a, a anomaly detection uh, uh, for my metric data. Um, how do I use that? Well, you use it by feeding that into your event processing pipeline. But how do I know if it's useful? You know, I, I, I could do anomaly detection for every metric that I have in my network. And that is actually you know, quite a challenging process to do some of, some of these things. Uh, uh, so how do I understand actually whether it's giving me any value? Well, if you imagine if I do, if I apply anomaly detection to my link utilization data, and it picks up that I've got something here that is not normal and generates an alert. If that alert was the first in one of those groups, then it's identified that problem before anything else has. And so that's offered some value. You know, if, it, if it warns me of a problem five minutes before anything else complains, that's given you value in terms of reducing your time to, to detect a problem. If it's the last incident, if it's the last alert in a group, it's not giving you a great deal of value. So um, if it, however, is within that group is the thing that indicates causality, it is offering you value. So the point here is that, you know, I wouldn't suggest you do anomaly detection for all of your underlying metric data. There are cases where it makes sense, there are cases where it doesn't. But you, before you do widespread anomaly detection, you really want an event processing pipeline so that you can understand whether or not this is going to give you some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of value. Okay, so let's, um, so let's just show what, what that looks like. So let's say I, I take my time series data in. I have a function, this anomaly detection function, which is um, you know, an analytic function that's taking the metric data that is in some way uh, analyzing that data and identifying we've got certain metrics in here which are not within the norm. Therefore, these things, I'm going to generate an alert. That alert goes into my event processing pipeline and my event processing uh, and you know, where that alert sits in the clustering of those events determines whether or not it's significant um, to me. Okay. All right. So that's the conceptual side. I'm now going to talk about putting it together, um, uh, and then we'll get to, um, uh, to Paola will demonstrate some of these things. So we want to we want to do what we've just done. We want to uh, uh, how do we develop those analytics pipelines? We mentioned that we want to bring together you know, data that was previously in silos. Uh, we want to bring together our network data, our, our, our data center data. We want to bring all of that together. So now we're actually creating quite a big data set. You know, if you just look at performance management data in one domain, it, it may not justify a big data analytics approach. But the more data that we bring together to give us the broadest view, then the the more really we're in the big data domain. But also, now, I'm talking about service assurance, which is these two functions here, if you like, in terms of fault management and performance management. But there's a whole set of other functions that need to use that underlying data. Okay. So a way that we've realized uh, um, uh, what I described in terms of those analytics pipelines is by effectively realizing them as analytics functions on a big data platform. And that big data platform can support a broad set of functions, not just service assurance. Um, we've done that on a, uh, uh, on a platform called uh, Panda. I know there's no A. We had to lose an A for trademark reasons. I'll talk about Panda. So Panda, platform for network data analytics, and I'm going to talk about that just for a couple of slides, and then we'll get to um, the implementation. So what is Panda? Um, Panda is a big data analytics platform we've developed in Cisco, and we've contributed it to open source. Um, we published that into open source mid last year, and now it's a Linux Foundation project. Um, now, what Panda does is, if you, you know, if you decide in your environment that the problem you have is a big data analytics problem, and in some in some cases it may not be. If you've got a relatively small environment, it may not be. But if you do, 
and you want to use a platform in order to address that problem, then essentially the, the, what Panda does is bring together all the underlying components you need in order to build out that platform. If you don't, you know, if your alternative is to is, is, is potentially to build that yourself, which is quite a, quite a big task. Um, this is a, you know, a general picture of Panda which shows multiple data sources coming in. Uh, in this case, you'll see from different plugins, so these could be bringing in metric data, event data, NetFlow data, multiple other data sources, which come into a data distribution layer, various stores in order to put those data in, and then functions in order to be able to process and present the outputs of those. So, let's have a look then at how we, and uh, I'm going to skip through the build, at how we realize that system that we showed before. Yep. Using different, using different functions. So, data coming in. What's bringing, uh, what's bringing my underlying data in? So in this case, I'm using several different things. I'm using ODL. ODL is open daylight, uh, if you're familiar with that. In this case, used to bring metric data in. Um, various things out there that you can use to bring metric data in. Things that you may already have or, uh, uh, um, uh, or, or, or systems that are out there in open source. In this case, we're using Logstash to bring log data in. Logstash, the name, if you're familiar with Logstash, the name is a bit of a misnomer. It doesn't just do logs. You can bring multiple plugins to Logstash, collect D. Uh, NetFlow, various other data sources, and then in terms of event data, in terms of uh, model data, you know this context we use to decorate um, uh, the results. In this case, you know different sources we can use for that. ODL, so Open Daylight, as an example, but also NSO, uh, which is uh, the the Cisco Network Service Orchestrator. So the Yang models in these things can be used to as context in order to be able to enrich the output of the analytics. So these are my inputs. Okay. And I'm you know, uh, taking this across both the infrastructure but also across the quality of experience uh, uh, measurement. I've then got my primary pipeline. So we did the noise filtering, the clustering, the cause isolation, and then incident and problem management. Now in this case, we're using uh, a, a product called Moogsoft to do that. Um, and um, we can see that in the demo. Uh, you'll see that. So why I, I showed functional blocks, you know, you don't necessarily realize those functional blocks by having to put them together yourselves. Um, so that's quite an intensive task. Um, in terms of anomaly detection, um, in this particular case, uh, we've implemented several algori algorithms for anomaly detection, but there are things out there that you can use to do that. So for something like, something like Prelert, uh, which, is, uh, which, which is a plug into Elasticsearch, that will do anomaly detection across metric data for you. So that was kind of dealing, you know, this is how we deal with our anomaly detection for our metrics feeding into our event processing pipeline. And then lastly, at the bottom here, you know, if we want to do some deeper, di uh, deeper, un deeper delving into the data to see what's going on, perhaps here we're being told we've got an incident, it's impacting customers, there's this set of events associated with that incident. It's quite right. Okay. Um, so then we've got our application for anomaly detection, and then down here we might need to do some, you know, deeper, uh, uh, deeper looking at the underlying log data or that's going on in order to understand what's happening with server one that was pulled out in this. And so here, you know, we may have log search as a function, say, to do that deeper analysis. So Paolo is going to show essentially, you know, a, a chunk of this uh, realized in practice. There's also a demo. Uh, downstairs where she can show she can show that in action um, and I think at the Moogsoft stand as well you can go and see how, how, how Moogsoft implement that function. Before we get to that I want to talk about go back to you know we, we've kind of been through what is service assurance define service assurance okay these are the functions we can use this is how we can implement it but we've got to turn that question right back to the start and say but how do we know if this is actually giving us a better answer, or as good an answer, or a better answer than we were getting before. Why use analytics? You know, why? There's no point in doing it just for the sake of doing it. You've got to do it because it gives you some sort of gain. So, how do you measure the gain? Could we measure it by just our availability of our network or services? 
Well, the answer is you can't. You can't use that as a measure of how effective your service assurance system is. Because, you know, your, your network might be 100% available, but you have the worst service assurance system in the world because your network is, you know, the best in the world. Conversely, you may have an amazing service assurance system, but if your network is atrocious, you know, your, your availability of your network is still not going to be improved. So we can't use classic measures of, of, of network availability as a measure of whether a service assurance system is effective. So we've got to use different measures. Okay? And this is to measure the service assurance system rather than the network it's, it's, it's monitoring. So to measure it, we need to treat it like a black box. And that black box has a set of inputs, a set of configuration and customization, which is effort we put in to make it work. And then it's got outputs. And those outputs are, are, are the tickets or the alerts that people are using to, to understand how to fix a problem. So if we look at those outputs, we can use those outputs as a way of understanding whether a service assurance system is working or not. So let's try and understand how, you know, how, how do we do that. So, so basic, basic things. Percent of service impacting issues first identified by the service assurance system. Target 100%. What does this mean? Well, you know, if a customer phones up with a problem and a ticket is created because a customer phones up with a problem, you should be able to map that ticket to an existing incident in your service assurance system. If you haven't, you know, you've got a problem. Your service assurance system isn't telling you proactively that you've got, a, you've got an issue. So our target's 100%. We may not achieve that, but, you know, set that as the goal. Conversely, percent of, service Im uh, uh, percent of reported faults for which there is a corresponded system detection fault, you want that to be 100%. You never want a case where, where, where there isn't an underlying system detected fault. That's one measure, okay? Another measure, percent of different tickets for which there is a single underlying cause. So you don't want three tickets for the same underlying problem, okay? Because if you've got that, you've got three people trying to fix the same problem, okay? So you want this to be zero. You really don't want multiple duplicate tickets for the same underlying issue. I don't want my optical team going away and trying to fix a problem at the same time my IP team are going away to fix the same problem in isolation without knowing that it's, it's the same underlying problem. Um, next, percent of junked tickets. Okay. These, are, these are tickets or incidents for which there's no, no action. Okay. Just a waste of, if I have to go and spend an hour looking at something to say not important, that's a waste of time. So we really don't want those. Um, Lastly, a uh, uh, percent of repeat incidents. Um, ideally, uh, this shouldn't happen, you know. If I've, uh, now, quite often, I don't know something's a repeat incident. So, at the least, I need to know whether I've seen this thing before, because if I have, whatever remediation I did didn't, didn't work. Okay. So, the point of this is to say, if you put this effort into looking at new approaches to service assurance, you really need to upfront have a clear way that you're going to measure whether or not they're going to give you any benefit. And if you don't, you'll spend a lot of time cycling through, oh, it looks interesting, but, you know, is it useful? It's costing us in effort to look at it and, and so forth. So we've done that. And we've done that more times than I would have liked to have done that, but we've done that a few times. Um, and, um, you know, we looked at those same... Uh, uh, we looked at those same characteristics, and in our, you know, in the work that we've done, we've seen positive outcomes. So these give you some of the data points from some of the deployments. So here's a case where we've got um, uh, 400, uh, 400 million log messages per day. This was for, you know, an infrastructure project. A lot of log messages, but that, you know, in terms of noise reduction. 6.9's noise percentage noise reduction on that, which means a lot of that is, you know, is really not useful for identifying issues. Boiled down to 250 really service impact, uh, real issues a day to address. So, you know, you can see that this, from this to this is a pretty significant, you know, step forward. Um, now, we did this in parallel looking at old systems to new systems so that we could clarify, okay, well, is this picking up everything the old system does and uh, uh, is this picking up anything the old system doesn't? And we were able to identify that we did pick up everything that we had before uh, uh, and we also picked up some things that we didn't. So, you know, by these measures, the outcome in our case was that it, uh, uh, the solution was more effective. Now, at that point, I would like to hand over to Paula and Paola's going to show you, you know, this in practice. Um, okay. 
Is that going to work for you? Yeah, I'll switch. Okay, so I'm going to show a small piece that is how, of course, using analytics needs to be a bit of help in order to actually have that deterministic outcome. So how I can actually identify which is the service that is impacted. And John was speaking about the context, the context that I can get from either an orchestrator system or a controller or any other form of, of inventory. In this case, we are using the orchestration because we are not using the orchestration only to get the context, but we are using also the orchestration to automate the onboarding of the service into the assurance system. So we are saving also time between when the service is deployed and when I can start monitoring the service. So one of the things that we are doing is actually we are taking the function pack, so the definition of the service in Young model, and we are extending that model with the descriptor that we need to contextualize the information that I receive from the service. So I actually have different assurance descriptors. In this, uh, in this case, I actually, the customer asked to identify the service with the VPN ID, the sub VPN ID, the access design and so on. Of course, because I'm defining this as part of the young model, I can modify it based on the case. There is no development, but only a definition. Whatever I can define then through the young model, I can automate using the orchestration system. Another thing that in this use case we are going actually to define as part of the young model is also the active testing that I want to perform on the service. Because if I need to monitor an end-to-end -end service, and the first things that I need to identify is the health of the service, I don't need to understand where the service is going through first. I just need actually to ping if I can reach the end point of the service. And so we are using IPSLA probe in this uh, specific example. So I define my young model. I'm sending the young model to our orchestration system and the orchestration system trying start deploying. It's deploying the service configuration and I can see that the configuration is going through is deploying all the sub VPN, says developer uh, HR, is deploying my IPSLA probe with the specific information or where to ping. So this is important not only during the definition of the service or the deployment of the service, but also if the service changes. It's very important when the service is virtualized and the endpoint can actually move between my different uh, uh, data center. The other thing it actually does, so is deploying the service, is deploying all the instrumentation that I need to monitor that service. But then in order to contextualize, I need the specific information. So I want this information to, the, to be passed to my assurance system. So what we use here, we use it between in combination with NSO, the conf D, what it does is actually getting the transaction from NSO and based on this transaction and the enrichment that I define, so the context that I want to have, 
pass this information to my assurance system. So I don't need to understand the full topology of my service. I don't need to understand the few the dependency between the different layers. I just want to actually have specific tagging and the specific information that I can feed my natural language unsupervised machine learning or machine learning algorithm that I can use then to cluster the event. So in this view, I actually have this context. I pass also the context related to all the IPSLA. And here, if I can go on this one. It show you in real life what is happening. So here is my service, and in this case is an I1 service. I define the different component of the service, so each component will have its own name. All this information are passed to the assurance system. These are just the plain event as they come in uh, into the system. And all the event, as you see, has been actually enriched uh, with a specific information. Then because the system know the information about the context, uh, can actually cluster the event based uh, on that specific tagging that I have associated at the source. And all these, again, happen in an uh, automatic way. So I'm going to be a bit long. What I'm going to show, maybe, is another one. showing how I can actually identify backbone failure. I can isolate where the failure is. Well, it's on the backbone. And I can understand that uh, backbone failure is actually impacting my overlay services. So. So in this case, I actually have already identified there is a core infrastructure failure. The first, uh, the first point is actually identify where the problem is, right? Is actually in the core, is actually on the overlay service, is actually on my app, on my data center, is actually on my CP. So I wanted to understand where is the problem, because finding exactly where is the problem can help me out in alerting the right people to actually work on the problem. Of course, here I actually have all the event that has been clustered together. There is a, a good view that is actually used in this sense, that is this one. I like that a lot, because uh, if I can stop. So I cluster all the event. There are actually operators that uh, uh, they just want to see the event pattern, right? But uh, by looking at the event pattern, they understand right away where the problem is. There are op other operators that need a, a little of help. So this one is actually showing the event as they come in during time. So each different square represents a different event. So you can see that maybe a certain event is coming uh, every time at a certain, uh, with a certain frequency, and there are different events that are coming over time. But if you look at this one, right at the beginning, most probably one of those is also the trigger or is also the root cause of, uh, of the actual problem. So if I can just, add, just adding to Paola's point and relating it back to the previous discussion. So if you look here, each one of these things here, each line represents one of those clusters. And if you look in this cluster, we've got 96 alerts. So the underlying analytics have basically done the noise filtering, clustered that 96 uh, alerts as associated. And then as Paolo was saying, this is then that viewer, those 96 alerts over time. So you know we've already got indications now of which of those things was it that happened first. And then if you look in da -da 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 -da, this column, you see service impacting. And down here, this one, we've got service impacting Tesco. So in this in this case, you know, the, the mapping of that service inventory to the underlying incident was able to identify that that's a service impacting issue from which you can, you can prioritize those that impact a service over those that don't. Sorry, the other point that we can identify here is that because I'm monitoring all my system 
and I'm not actually monitoring just the core network or the service. I can identify that my situation related to the core is actually impacting a situation related to the service. And here I can have the linkage. So the operator that is actually assigned to monitor the service, the very first thing that he can do, he can actually look at I actually have an infrastructure problem that is impacting my service. If I have an infrastructure problem, I don't need to bother. Someone else is actually fixing my infrastructure problem. If uh, the corp, the the person that is looking at the core will actually have immediate the identification that the problem that is having in the core need to be fixed with a high priority because it's impacting a certain number of services. And all of this is done without model, without topologies, using, uh, again, analytics, uh, supervised and supervised machine learning, and the right level of enrichment of the data that, that we can get from the orchestration system. Thanks, Paola. Okay. So that was um, that was a pretty whistle-stop run through. Forty-five minutes is you know it's a bit of, it's quite a challenge for that session. Uh, I hope it was useful. Any questions uh, from anyone? If you want to have questions offline, uh, you know feel free. Um, come and discuss with us. We'll be around here for for the next few minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>